yourself. But in any sense, uh, the speaker and I, the host, the expert panelists will be turning on the mic and the cameras. Okay, so later while we ask questions, then that's going to be where the question askers will get to turn on the camera. Okay, so 31. Okay, we do have a little bit more till we start. For those who, people who are, who are new to this, please go and follow the OSG's WeChat account or OSG's events mini program and see what OSG is all about. They have a lot of interesting events that you guys can see. They are a wonderful organization. And yeah, overseas SG. So it's catered for Singaporeans. They are venturing overseas. Okay, guys, if any of you want to post any questions, right? Uh, for those of you not familiar with Zoom, you can actually post your questions at the chat button there. So uh, if you post a question here, let's say if there's a lot of questions to be answered, right? Then me as a moderator, I will get to choose like, whose questions get answered. But I'll try to be fair. Lah. Then like, I will make to try as much as possible to make Nick answer every question. But in the time constraint, we are not able to do that. So I might have to say sorry to some of you in advance that we might left out your questions. But if you have any questions, please type in the group chat. Then we can see your questions and basically everybody can see it. Then we'll pick it and then Nick will answer it. Okay, I think that we have a healthy, we have a healthy attendance right now. And maybe I will just call the beginning of the sections. Okay, so for, for the start, the Ken will do a brief introduction about OSG, what OSG is about. So let's give a round of applause to Kent, the communication director of OSG. Okay, just do a virtual clap. Lah. So, okay, I will. Kent, you're up next. Well, don't, thank you, Zhong Yi. Uh, I am Ken, the communications director of uh, OSG Youth uh, Alliance. And this is a fifth uh, edition of our weekly uh, Young Founders uh, Weekly Webinar Series. Um, a little bit about uh, OSG. Um, OSG is uh, incorporated in Singapore. Uh, it's funded by uh, Dr. Taning Han, otherwise known as the 200 kilometer man two years ago. And it is a social enterprise and which serves a, a network of global minded and enterprising youths who believe in creating a positive impact in the world today and the future. Now, an interesting point to note, as uh, Joey mentioned, that it, we started as uh, only for Singaporean, uh, overseas Singaporean students and interns, but we have expanded, we've grown over the uh, past three years, and now we are reaching out to not only Singaporean uh, young people, but really across the region, between China, from China, Singapore, ASEAN, and across the globe. Okay. Um, what we focus on, we focus on um, delivering youth uh, development programs and essentially they are targeted at learning, mentoring, career and uh, entrepreneurship uh, driven um, uh, initiatives and opportunities and cross-cultural uh, communications among young people, professionals and corporations. Our presence um, from Singapore to Shanghai to Beijing, Shenzhen and Hangzhou. Hey, right. Uh, yes, uh, like right now, this is uh, possibly, you know, during the COVID-19 uh, situation right now, this is our most prominent uh, and active uh, program. Uh, we are into the fifth edition 
uh, of our weekly webinar series. And we're running in the season, uh, in, in a season meaning three months. So you can expect there are about seven more series, uh, seven more of a search webinars to come. If you are interested to speak up, or if you know of anybody who is a young founder, preferably under 30, okay, uh, and if it's got a compelling story, look out for Mr. Miss Lily Wong. Okay, um, at the same time, we are also organizing um, in partnership with uh, FUSA and uh, students, uh, Singapore Students Association of Beijing in this uh, e-forum series. It is an entirely uh, student-initiated um, uh, program for which uh, OSG plays the enabler and the supporter role. Okay, um, we are running into the second edition that's coming up uh, next Saturday. Okay, and that's the title, you can look it up. And uh, once we have uh, more details, we'll uh, share with you. Right, um, Mentor for Mentee program, again, it is one of our signature program because uh, we believe in uh, maintaining such a mentor-mentee um, relationship between uh, young people and uh, professionals uh, as well as uh, business owners for a healthy uh, mutual um, interaction as well as uh, the growing up process. Okay, so this extends uh, not just in Shanghai in China, but really like I mentioned across China and Singapore. Okay, and uh, what you could see on the screen, there are uh, some programs that we have uh, started since last year. And uh, once the program, once the COVID situation uh, is uh, over, or we can get back to some normalcy, normalcy uh, Lily will offer you with uh, more information about this program. Next is uh, Youth for Change for uh, programs. So these are a series of uh, programs uh, done entirely. Again, uh, the initiatives are actually by the students. Okay, uh, essentially from business case or competitions to hackathons uh, and uh, startup day. Okay, um, <clears throat> next, uh, learn for exposure uh, program. These are specifically uh, for our overseas interns and students, networking sessions for learning and sharing. Okay, um, more on learn for exposure. And uh, yes, finally, we are at the program today. And before handing over to uh, Zhong Yi, I'd like to mention um, today's uh, webinar is made possible uh, by supporting organizations. These are really good friends and partners, namely um, Nian Polytechnic, our global enterprise, our entrepreneurial internship, uh, Singcham Shanghai, Meicham Shanghai, uh, President X, uh, last but not least, uh, Recruit Plus, a headhunter firm. Okay. Um, a little bit of Zhong Yi. He has done, uh, I think, his fair share of a self introduction. He needs no more further introduction from me, except that um, Zhong Yi and I are very good friends, family friends as well. Uh, just in case you do not, you are curious, he, as I mentioned to some friends, his English and Chinese are better than most of us Singaporeans here. Hmm. Okay, now over to Zhong Yi. Okay, thank you, Ken. So uh, maybe I just. After this introduction, I'll show you a time flow of what's going to like of our presentation today. So, moment please, let me put on the screen. So, okay. So this is what it's going to like. There's going to be a introduction section, which we has gone through about like half of it already. It's supposed to be five minutes, but it could drag longer if I keep on talking. So I just stop talking and then proceed on and let speaker sharing begin. Speaker sharing, Nick, will be sharing his experience about his education experience, his work experience, how he transferred from a consultant to an entrepreneur, then to a team of investors that keeps on going. How does he keep himself driven? And to be successful, that's allowed him to be semi-retired before he's 30. And after he shared his... After he shared his experience, there's going to be 35 minutes of Q&A. This 35 minutes of Q&A is going to be separated between... Uh, panelists, uh, pa expert panelists questions and questions from the floor. So we will be taking questions from the floor. So if anyone who would like to ask the questions, please post your questions in the group chat items in the Zoom. So if there's a lot of questions to choose from, which we hope that there's going to be a lot of questions to choose, then we will choose the questions and post and ask Nick directly the questions. But I will apologize in advance to some of you if I didn't pick your questions because if we have an overwhelming response, then we cannot we cannot like postpone this until like 1 a.m. We hope to be able to do so, but everybody needs to rest, healthy lifestyle. So, and after the Q&A section, there's going to be a, please, everybody, please switch on your cameras and we'll do a virtual group photo of the Zoom where everybody's 
camera is actually on the screen and every shows that everybody's awesome faces and let's have an awesome event. So regarding the panel experts today, there will be two experts asking the questions today. One is Mr. Steven Sim and one is Mr. Kenny Lim. So as you can see, Mr. Steven's experience is mostly in the finance sector and he is serving as a CFO for his company right now. So he is a finance expert. Whereas on the other side, Mr. Kenny Lim, he run his own boutique agency. So he is actually very well versed in the business identity. So please everybody look forward to the kind of interesting and sharp and difficult questions that they are going to bring up and ask Nick. And last and the most awesome one is Mr. Nicholas Tan. He's the founder of East Ocean Capitals. But then if you want, right, please go and read the words on here in the introduction about yourselves. But he's going to elaborate more during his introductions. And I guess that you guys are saying tired of my face right now. And without further ado, let me hand over to Mr. Nicholas Tan, model, entrepreneur, investors, and a serious entrepreneur. So let's have a round of virtual applause and welcome Mr. Nicholas Tan. Wait, let me stop sharing. Okay. Hello, hello. Okay, great. Um, very happy to be sharing with you guys today. I'm not a very seasoned speaker, so <laughs> this is quite an unusual uh, uh, session for me. So um, please feel free to put in any comments, you know, on whatever um, I, I missed out or you want to hear uh, more of. So without further ado, let me go into um, my personal journey. All right, so throughout this, um, I'm just going to go through like a timeline uh, of my journey so far. And then I will share a few stories here and there of uh, uh, interesting uh, tidbits or lessons that I learned along the way. So starting out, right? So my parents are, uh, you know, I think in, uh, everyone knows my parents are <laughs> as a professor and my mom's a CFO. So they actually, when growing up, they always wanted me uh, uh, to be a doctor. Um, and that was also what I studied in school. Um, I think that a lot of uh, people their parents were wanting you to be doctors or lawyers, but like now it's kind of um, changed um, to become you know, more entrepreneurial as, as tech has come up. But one thing that my parents um, had, were really supportive uh, uh, with me about um, was swimming. So when I, when I was growing up, I was uh, swimming for Singapore and you know, I couldn't have done it without the support of my parents. Swimming taught me uh, a lot, like such as, the most important thing I think is the ability to uh, wake up you know, and do something when everyone is sleeping. Because if you do what everyone else is doing, right, and I've, I've really learned that later on, if you do what everyone else is doing, you're gonna get what everyone, everyone gets, right? So um, that is, I think, one thing that, you know, growing up swimming and my parents taught me a lot. Going to, to Harvard from Raffles was actually um, not straightforward. I still remember when I was in uh, Raffles, my uh, our RJC counselor, I shall not mention names, um, they told me that, you know, I would never make it into that school. And when I asked them to write a recommendation, um, my the, the school counsellor was actually very hesitant against doing it. So yeah, but you know, that's it. Eventually, um, somehow I, I made it in, right? I can also share with you, like a lot of people at Harvard or any of these Ivy schools don't really know how they got in. Um, but yeah, and, and at Harvard, I think one of the main things that um, I learned Right? It was that uh, community uh, is really, really important. Uh, at Harvard, I definitely learned more from my friends than from anyone or any class, any professor. Um, you know, I was rooming next to uh, uh, a Romanian ballerina who like sprained her back and that's why she had to go back to school. And then uh, next to, I remember on the on my other side was this like volleyball player who was also really interested in particular physics. So it was really eclectic mix, but that was also where I learned that, you know, you have to be a little crazy and everyone's like just really good at that one thing, even if no one has heard of that one thing. And that has really, uh, you know, kind of stuck with me as I uh, continue out and, you know, venture into uh, work, you know, venture into the entre entrepreneur space. So after um, school, actually I spent uh, my last year uh, still trying to qualify for the Olympics. Um, and then I, I didn't make it. I was like, really, really sad. 
And then for like, for two months, I actually bummed around and like didn't really want to start work. Although I had like pending work offers. And it was actually um, uh, because I watched, I started watching up TV and I watched a show called Suits. So Suits, right, the main character is, is this guy called Mike. And he basically like has a fake Harvard degree and like, you know, just goes around like doing like really cool deals. So I really watched it. And yeah, of course, you know, inside like I, I wanted, I felt like I had to work, but I was also, also like really sad. Because, you know, like when you finish um, off like an uh, athletic career and being forced into retirement, right? It's not something that I would say is very easy to handle. But when I, I thought, you know, he has a fake Harvard degree, you know, he's trying so hard, you know, committing fraud to do all this. You know, I have a real Harvard degree. I should go do something with my life. So that's when I took my uh, first job at, at Bain and Company. Um, I was there for about a year. And then after that, when, uh, you know, an opportunity came, I, I, I went to uh, this company called Shopee, which everyone knows today. But back then, um, mind you, in 2014, we didn't even really have confirmed the name, right? Everyone was on the MRTs looking at Carousel, Carousel, Carousel. When I wanted to join Shopee, even like my, some of my mentors um, from the Valley and a lot of people were like, you know, in Southeast Asia, tech is not ready. But this is also like six years ago, right? There was no logistics, no payments, you know, you don't have Ninja Band, Taku Bay, all this. So it was a, a big risk for me to, to there was, I think, you know, like for me, it was like a half risk step to, to leave a stable job and then go over to a startup. And, you know, I'm very lucky that, 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 that it paid off. And I was there for about a year plus, you know, so when we were there, I launched, because I was one of the earliest employees, so we launched Shopee into seven countries. Um, we got them to number one in the store. And then after that, you know, at some point, uh, I had this idea to do an ad tech uh, uh, platform. And then that was, I think that was the part where I was like, okay, let me take a, 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 a stronger lead. Actually, when I was, when I had this idea, right, I actually applied to, you know, there's this EDB grant thing. And I still remember, uh, I, because I think it's like, you get 20,000 or something, you put in 15,000, 50,000. I still remember, I submitted everything, you know, I was like quite hopeful, very optimistic. And then EDB, even <laughs> like EDB replied with um, saying my idea wasn't novel enough. So that not novel idea today, right, it's like paid off really well. It's, I wouldn't say it's novel or not novel, right? But in terms of like that kind of other businesses that uh, I think Singapore has supported, you know, we did really well. So I think what I'm trying to say, you know, it's like regardless of, you know, all these grants, you know, this, you get rejected, you get that, as long as you have your business um, value proposition in check, right? And you're offering something that the customer wants, you can make a business out of that. It doesn't always have to be like a billion dollar kind of idea. And yeah. So going to, to, to China, you know, um, why, I think, why did I uh, go to China? Or like, you know, what was I thinking when, when I went there? Uh, a lot of um, it was due to, I think, my age and the, the, the situation I, uh, I was in. So I was, you know, number one, like my financial situation was, was pretty good. Um, you know, I had enough cushion to go there and also like, you know, be my own uh, uh, investor, you know, see investor to, to start off wherever I wanted to start it. Secondly, um, you know, relationship wise, I wasn't tied down with a partner. I think that's quite important because if you have to leave your partner for a startup, usually it doesn't really work out. That's just what I've seen. Uh. Usually, you know, like it's important, I think, to have a partner that like sticks with you throughout the way. So I think the, the, the next two, you know, the age is really important for someone in Singapore trying to go to China. I feel like if you know uh, you don't you don't make that leap by like thirty five, a lot of high achieving people will already be in like pretty um, good jobs, right? But that is not to say that you know you can never you can never go go there. But I think that point for me, you know, because China was like quite it was still quite wild wild west to me back then being a Singaporean. Um, so yeah, being 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 pretty bold and young, like I'm quite like risk loving, right? I think that helped a lot. So I think the next question, you know, that I, I, I had was, you know, why, some people ask me why China, right? I think uh, it's pretty, it's pretty obvious. I think first is, you know, the, the first and the last point you actually really need is the market size, 
right? Like the worst, like last time, you know, with Shopee, with the, we were the best M in Singapore and we had 100,000 um, um, downloads in a month, in a few months. Um, in China, the worst game, the worst ad, if you only did like very minimal marketing, you would have 100,000 downloads. So, you know, every download trans, trans, translates to uh, revenue, you know. So if you just do the, the quick easy math, um, for the same amount of effort that you would put, because I was in Singapore, right, the same amount of effort that you put, you could achieve a lot more in a place where the market is bigger. And second, you know, and second is something that I have to like, partially thank my parents for, um, because they forced me to study Chinese. Um, and my Chinese is still not very good, but... You want uh, to show off your Chinese a little bit here? No, I now I'm talking about Chinese. I still have a lot of foreign people's mouths. Right? But when you go to China... It's okay, it's okay. But when you go to China and you want to, you know, say you want to do business in China and you cannot read a contract back to back, you are just not ready. Or you haven't, you know, put in the time or the hours to show that you're ready. And it's really, it's really tricky to... Um, require an assistant or a translator to like fine comb every document um, or every uh, uh, PL or like type of your, your, you know, your, all your income statements um, uh, before you, 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 you review it. So, yeah, for everyone who understand the statement even, in order to make a judgment on the statement. Who, <laughs> who is thinking of going to China, your, your Chinese must be on point. And it's like your business Chinese needs to be on point. Okay, Nick, so how did I begin my entrepreneurial journey? So I think, you know, I, I actually heard a few of the previous um, uh, uh, people, you know, like entrepreneurship is quite hard. You know, like they, they have to like sleep, I don't know, over their friends or whatnot. But, but for me, and this is actually what I frankly do believe in, is that, um, you know, the, you, you want to, if you're going to a foreign market, right, like China, you need to go and create a business from a position of strength, right? So when I went there, I literally just checked myself into the higher on the bun and, uh, you know, did a lot of uh, meetings there and also set up a work, workspace. So I stayed there for months. It wasn't cheap. Um, and I, but I think that, you know, having the basic necessity of like having good food, you know, a good place um, and all that is really important. And also one thing um, that really helped was, so why I went there was because I was, uh, one of my friends knew the rooms manager in the high on the bun, at the high on the bun in, in, in Shanghai. And I also had a few, you know, a good local friends uh, that I could sort of like, you know, build a community with. So uh, I, there was a local coffee shop that I would uh, uh, go to, you know, so I would know like a few restaurant owners, um, a few like uh, 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 clubbing friends, right? So then I kind of built my own like Xiao Shi Dai, or like your friends, or that, you know, your will and grace kind of thing in Shanghai. And that, you know, support system is really important when you're going to a uh, new place to build these kind of like, you know, someone who can feed you when you're sad, someone who can party with you or drink with you when you're sad. Um, these kind of local friends there. And then, yeah, second, secondly, you know, I think there's, this is a lot more straightforward. You know, you need to have a differentiated product um, um, in China. Yeah, so like, you know, the last, I think the last uh, thing I just want to uh, share, you know, like, is, you know, a few things, oh my God, okay, the few things that, you know, I wish that I can uh, share my earlier self, right? So the first thing is to socialize more. So throughout my years, although I have um, uh, gone out, you know, I also spent a lot of time studying. I think everyone has, you know, put, coming from Singapore, coming from Asia, a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on um, studies. Uh, but, you know, building, building these kind of networks professionally, both in your workplace and also in your school, building friendships, you know, that really helps you get on in, in, in your life. This is what I like to share with people, right? No one looks back on their life and remembers the nights they got plenty of sleep. Right, so it's true, like over, even up to now, right, I remember um, some nights where I, the, all the nights I remember are the nights where I didn't sleep, right. Um, I was in uh, uh, Milan for a shoot once um, and, you know, I was like completely unprofessional just going out. Uh, and that's when I met, you know, like there is a CEO, there is someone today 
you know, going to be like one of our major clients, um, eight years, eight years on, going to be one of our major clients um, from one of our companies. So, you know, like, it's this kind of like serendipitous um, things, but you need to kind of be social enough to put yourself out there. Um, and, you know, when your friends are going out, don't be like, okay, don't be the boring guy and be like, okay, I'm not going to go. So the next one, right, is know what you are good at and only do that. Right? I think it took a while for me to, to, to kind of come back to this because um, initially uh, a lot of things came uh, pretty straightforwardly. But I think, you know, for a lot of the, 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 the businesses or like the, the businesses and areas that um, I became successful in, it is really when I really knew that subject area. And I really knew the ins and outs of that particular industry that I was able to build something differentiated. Right now, when we invest into um, companies, uh, I have quite a strict rule or like it's tried quite a strong feeling that if it's this product is for like say mother and baby, right? Then we would find a mother who found this problem, right? If this product was for the doctor's community, it will be hard pressed for us and I think a lot of people to, 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 to invest into an engineer that tells us that they can solve a doctor's issue. Right? And I think for a lot of people who are trying to build their own startups, they try and build it based on, okay, I feel like this market is growing. I feel like that market is growing. But if you haven't actually worked in, you know, as a, as a, as a, in your occupation in that area, it's quite hard for you to really understand how to develop a product and later on, how to sell it, right? How you ex execute your end-to-end -end sales and all that. And then the last thing that I wanted, I, it's, okay, it's three things now. The last thing that I wanted to share um, is uh, learn to worry only about what you can control, right? So I think along, along the way um, of entrepreneurship, there's a lot of uncertainty, not just entrepreneurship. I think, you know, when you are uh, uh, changing jobs, you know, like, or you want to do, make a, a one decision, you know, your parents are going to say this, I was going to say that, everyone's going to say this. And even when um, I was putting on my last time, my dad was like laughing at me. But, you know, this is what I actually uh, uh, kind of live by, you know, and, 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 and believe. So don't worry about those who talk behind your back, right? Because they're behind you for a reason. And this is something that, you know, I feel like if you believe and know what you're doing is right, then you just have to, use your voice and make it matter um, and then you know not really worry about what everyone's thinking or worry about things that you cannot control because if you do that you're really going to take your focus away from making a change that you can actually do that's right in front of you that you are not doing yeah so that's all i wanted to to share today thank you okay, awesome thank you nick for sharing and right now, we shall move to the question and answer period. So I'm uh, sorry, guys. Uh, if you want to post your questions, please post your questions in the group chat. We'll select it and answer it later. But right now, uh, maybe we'll turn to the expert panels and allow them to ask a few questions first. So maybe we'll start with Mr. Steven Sim. Steven? Uh, wait, uh, let me find the Steven's profile and then let him, and I will spotlight him, put him on the spotlight. Um, Okay, Stephen, you're up. I understand that you have a question for Nick. Hi, Nick. Uh, congratulations on your achievement so far. Uh, I think it's been an amazing journey and uh, your background is very intriguing, uh, both to myself and I'm sure to a lot of the listeners out there. Um, so one, one question I have, and I guess to some extent you touched on it, on some of the things that you want to tell your earlier, earlier self, but to be more specific, um, what were some of the mistakes that you have made? And were, they, were, were those mistakes uh, detrimental? Uh, on hindsight, were they actually helpful uh, to bring you where you are today? Can you, can you mm. share some? I think, um, you know, in terms of mistakes, whether it's detrimental, right? Um, you know, any, I feel like any business mistakes are not is honestly not detrimental because you know there's always tong shan right? If anything, they can any if 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 it's a problem that money can solve, it's really not a problem because you know you have like your health and you know other like family things that, that I think those are like you know I would put into into detrimental mistakes. In terms of mistakes that 
I think business mistakes that I, I made, right? I think there isn't one that is like, okay, I, I didn't come back from. I think everyone is honestly like a, a, a lesson, right? But um, I've definitely spent um, and invested uh, uh, into things that I didn't understand because I thought I was smart enough to understand it at the time. So, you know, just going into areas where I wasn't expertise early uh, and, and feeling that, okay, I, you know, this is something that I saw an opportunity, it makes sense, right? Then I, th I thought that uh, 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 it, it could be done like that, that we could do it. Does it answer the question? Okay, okay uh, yeah. I think the moment, okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for the question, Stephen. Yeah. So yeah, do you have any follow-up questions? I have an... Sorry, Stephen, you're breaking off. You are frozen. You're frozen in time, but a little bit more. Uh, so while Stephen's being frozen, shall we move on to our other expert panel, Mr. Kenny? Oh, hi, Nick. So, uh, hi, Kenny. Yeah, I don't understand eat. that you have a question for Nick also. So could I travel sure, you to nice ask to your questions you, now? Yeah. Yeah. Very nice to meet you. Um, you know, something I found very, uh, very intriguing as well is uh, your whole journey seemed to have been very, uh, very, very smooth and, and actually quite glamorous. We all know the journey uh, in the entrepreneurial um, pursuit uh, is, is, is definitely uh, fraught with a lot of disappointments too. I mean, I'm just interested also, you know, to, to, to hear your view, your experience, right, in your, in, your, in your journey, right? What has been the most consistent uh, negative emotions or feedback you have gotten from, you know, the, the, the world around you and how you deal with it? Mm. I think... Um... One, one thing that is quite challenging is my age for, to, to be doing what you know, I, I do. A lot of times, mo most of the times actually, when we are engaging you know, deals or clients, the person across me is like a 50-year-old China man or woman, like someone quite senior. So, you know, like there, there have been some things I, I, I do. You know, sometimes I actually honestly found it, found it and I got this inspiration from uh, the guy who founded um, Under Armour. So he would have two name cards. One name card is um, him as a, I think just a, a business exec. And then the other name card is him as a president. So that whenever he was, there was an, something that he couldn't uh, 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 answer on the other end, he would give the, uh, I'm a business exec, and then I have to go back to headquarters and like, you know, give your answer later on. So this just positioning myself, like, lower than the other person who is senior, but we may be actually doing the deal, you know, head on head. That has been uh, uh, helpful in handling the egos of some of these other businessmen. And that is one thing that I, I think there's quite a lot of resistance, honestly, to be a young uh, entrepreneur and like, you know, try and, trying to always hit above the bat that uh, people feel that you can hit. So you have met a lot of people who made you feel like uh, they didn't take you seriously, right? I mean, is that what you're trying yes. to say? Yeah. Yes, yes, so, yes. So how do you deal with this? I mean, I'm hearing this positive uh, tactic, right, of how you deal with it uh, real time mm. right, when you meet them. But I'm sure also, you know, when you, when you get rejected and you go back home and, 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 and go back to your desk, uh, it gets to you, right? I mean, I, I'm interested to hear your emotional management and, and maybe share, right? How you find this in the strength um, mm. how you do. I think that there were definitely times when I would take it very personally. And it, even today, you know, I, I would take it personally. Um, because you feel that, you know, you put so much time in it, right? Like I think as an entrepreneur, it's not like a job. So if it's a job, you're just like, okay, you know, whatever next. But when you take it so personally, um, then I wouldn't say I, I allow a period of, you know, myself to sell, right? But then even now when I tell everyone, you know, don't worry, don't worry, it's, it don't care about what people are thinking, right? Um, uh, it, I, I would still find myself in that situation. So like, sometimes it's, it's for a longer time, sometimes it's for a shorter time. Now it's like getting shorter and shorter, but like you just have to really identify that, you know, you're spending time thinking about something that um, you have no control over or something that already happened. It's like spilled milk and you have to move forward. 
right? And eventually, you need to start take, stop taking it personally. You need to really stop taking it personally. And I also, I also think that like along the way, right, um, one thing that happened was a lot of people that used to say no would come back and be like, yes. So when that happened, then I knew that, okay, you know, every time there's something negative, it's a no now is never a no forever. It's just that I'm not good enough now. So like thinking like that helped. But sometimes, you know, you'll still be like very sad. I think that's something that, at least for myself, is, is quite uncontrollable. Lah. Thanks for sharing. Okay, thanks. Speaking of like going personal and being sad, here is a question from Tan Chong Ming. What is your worst decision in life and how did you motivate yourself to come back? Mm, worst decision? I don't think I really have like a worst, worst decision. I, I, well, okay, I, I have one really bad decision, but I wouldn't say it was like bad, right? So when I was a uh, junior in uh, Harvard, um, I was out one night um, on the MIT campus and I was just like drinking with a bunch of uh, sorority girls. And then there were like two guys there. And then uh, they were like, okay, they were like trying to recruit. This was back in like 2009, 2009. They were trying to recruit like, like the, the, the like 14th employee for this company called Dropbox. And back then, Dropbox, I was like, what is Dropbox, right? And then they explained to me everything. I had just finished, um, I was cross-registered into the Harvard, uh, this Harvard class called Commercializing Science. So I was like trying to use all these like Harvard, you know, like uh, things that I just learned in class to like examine their business models. And of course, you know, from an academic uh, perspective, it was really, it really hit it um, on the spot. And they were like, oh, you know, like they actually interviewed a lot of people and they, they felt that I would be a good fit. Back then, I was like, uh, what is Dropbox? Like Dropbox is a shit stuff. I went and looked at the shit and I was like, okay, this, this thing is like not worth my time, right? So, so I would, do I think it's a bad decision? Yeah, I think it's a bad decision because if I had done that, right? It's like I would have achieved retirement way earlier. Okay, Dropbox. Then, then, then now, yeah, right? It's like, yeah, I think it's, it's most a lot of times, you know, in terms of worst decision, it's like deals that you miss or things that you didn't see, that you didn't catch on. Um, but less so than... Because if you, if you didn't do something that you should have done, right, then I'm going to do something else. So if the other something else, okay, then again, then it's, it's still, you know, it's still a good ending. Well, at least looking on the bright side, you're better than the Apple initial shareholders who sold off 10% of Apple share for 10,000 or 100,000 US dollars. You're much better <laughs> off than that guy. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, oh. So now we've on a good side already since you got yourself more high. Here's a question from Ingrid Mao. As you said, many things come and the world feels like an oyster when you are young. But how do you identify how do youngsters identify their strength and focus on those strengths? And what questions do youngsters ask themselves to identify what is their true strength? So I think you know, for us uh, 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 when you're strong at something, right, it's pretty clear. If you need to go and you know, like really try and think very hard, is this my strength? It's probably not your strength. Okay. <laughs> you know, back when I was swimming, you know, like actually I was uh, 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 just swimming like school team. And then you just suddenly won. And then when you win, everyone just comes to you and be like, oh, you know, you need to join national team. And then, then you know, okay, okay, this is my strength. Like I'm, I'm good at this. Or if let's say you're in a class or like, you know, you're doing a particular job and people have to go to like 10 sales meetings, you go into one, you know, you charm the person, you close that deal in like, you know, way shorter cycles than everyone. Then you know, hey, okay, you probably have a strength in sales, right? But it should be something that is, I think, uh, you're really, it's a mix of what you're passionate about, right? Because if you're passionate about it, it will come through when you're doing it and then it's going to affect the eventual uh, uh, success of this entire task. Mm, so, so it's more like you try to do it first, then if you're good at it, it will just be a peer. Yeah, so, so this yeah. comes to your like previous point about like socialize more. So when you try more things, there's more opportunities for you to discover that what you're really good at. Right? Yes, yes, definitely. Okay, and uh, sorry. Okay, thank you for the question, Ingrid. And the next question will be question by Mr. James Ong. So Nicholas, great story. Please kindly share with us how you decided to start East Ocean Capital and why. How did you find your current partners and what are the challenges you faced to get this started? Mm, so let me answer in a few parts. So why did I, how I decided to start it? So I decided to start, so that was um, uh, because, you know, we, I, I was going to China and I just finished my stint at, at, at Shopee. My next progression after being at a startup, right, would be to have my own startup and no longer be like, you know, number six or, you know, like founding team. Then I would just be like number one. Right, so that, I think for me, it was like a natural uh, 
natural progression. I think a lot of uh, people who first start out at founding teams um, kind of understand product life cycle, understand fundraising, understand you know, investment climate, and then they learn that they take it and then they do it themselves. Now. So I think that is quite natural. I, I didn't like just step out of school and, and do it. You know, I went to Bain, you know, was on the private equity ring fence. After that, went to tech, um, which I recovered at Bain. So it was, I did it in like small steps. The second part is, what's the second part? Um, how do I find my current partner? Yeah. I think for most of the, most of, um, you know, networking, right? It's uh, because I have a, like a, a, like a business network and uh, alumni network before I went to China. I had put time in to, you know, in Singapore working. So I think if, if you go early, like if you go like really early, I mean, you may be struggling to find, you know, credible or like solid business networks because you don't also, you also don't want to be in a net network where, you know, everyone is like your age. You want to be in a network where you can find mentors or people who have more experience that you can leverage on. So I was in these networks and these were the networks that I, I, I tapped on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Speaking of network, right? So like you mentioned just now a lot of your uh, your business experience actually come from your professional network. So this is mm -hmm. relevant to another question by Fabian Ng. It's like, hi Nick, really informative presentation here. Can you share your thoughts process for choosing Bain as your first job? And what journey did you take to get there? Mm. So, like, so development on your first career? My first job. So I think um, a lot of, uh, I, and I would still send a recommend this for a lot of undergraduates, right? If you're coming out and you're not sure what you want to do, like you don't know what you want to do, I would recommend, and you know you want to do business. I would recommend going for a uh, consulting or investment banking job. Because they, these two, um, you know, will give you uh, a good insight into the, the different segments and skill sets that you can tap on later. So for me, you know, investment banking, just too much work, too many hours. <laughs> I didn't want to work that high. And then I was like, okay, yeah. which, which, uh, which place had the least number of hours? I went to go and check between BCG, McKinsey and Bain. And I realized that Bain people work the least. So that's why I went to Bain. So the lease is how much? How many hours? hours. Are, like twelve hours so, a day, but they are working the lease. Twelve. Uh, I think about twelve hours a day, but yeah. that's like on the heavier and, side, right? Uh, McKinsey people work like more than twelve hours. They work like almost investment banker. So what's the average day for you like in Bain? For you. So, like we just I would work like eight hours lah, because or like eight to twelve, right? Um, I think I think the, like like. Like for me, like I'm like would be quite close to the average, um, at Bain, but like they definitely have a better work life culture compared to, um, McKinsey and BCG. I think the people at BC McKinsey and BCG like definitely burn out more. <laughs> Maybe I'm being, um, partial, but like yeah, I believe so. Well, you're talking about my consideration. Experience. Yeah, that was yeah. just my consideration. When, yeah, when I joined. But I, I frankly feel it really depends on culture, right? So they say McKinsey is like, or like McKinsey and Goldman is like your Harvard of like consulting mm -hmm. and investment banking. And then Morgan Stanley and BCG is like your MIT of it. So all the, like, okay. the more nerdy people go there. And people who want like, you know, more work-life balance, they would go to um, like Merrill Lynch or N N F A. Yeah, true. So guys, mm -hmm. when you know that next time I apply for work, which one to choose from uh, those are the pros and cons said by someone who's been through it okay and i think this next question is going to be relevant to all of us now this is at the reason for having a virtual meeting instead of a physical one melvin go asks us how has covid changed your investment strategy it has affected mm. us all and how has it specifically affected you so most of the companies that um, i've been in or like that we have invested in um, they are all online because I, my, my, my experience is like from a, from a, from a, a like tech background, right? So, so we, so it's actually helped accelerate the growth of our businesses because we don't do the offline stuff. So when everyone has been at home the last few months, we've actually experienced like record sales on our, on our um, companies and platforms. So it's, it's been, I think, you know, Partially is like lucky, but I also think that this is the trend like going forward, like with or without COVID, right? Like this just kind of accelerated and forced people who were not adopters to force them to adopt uh, online only, you know, strategy. 
for that particular product. So it's like strengthen your initial strategy of going online. Yeah, I think it, it, it yeah, it accelerates, accelerates everything. That's, All the online companies. Uh, in, in the, and then uh, this is another question about like, just now you talk a little bit about finding a co-founder and when you're in Shanghai, it's good to have someone that when you're down, they have a beer with you and it's good to have someone local who knows the ground. So a uh, question by Lo, Lo Jun is, how important it is to have a co-founder before finding a ad tech company and how to find one? So co-founder, I think is, uh, I mean, there, I think there are many ways to find a co-founder. There isn't like a, 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 right, a right way. Um, it can come from many places. It can come from your business networks, right? It can come from, if you go to like networking talks, it can come from you doing a, a, a deal, you know, and then you, you feel like you guys get along and then the guys feel like, okay, you know, we can do more together. Um, so I think, yeah, there, 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 there are many ways. How important is it, right? So eventually in China, and they'll teach you this at like a lot of the, most of the business schools, China is one of the few markets or maybe the only market besides like, like Russia or something, where they will tell you that you need a local partner in order to, in order to, to, to be successful. Like this is literally in the HBS, um, like textbook, a lot of business textbooks, all those case studies, they'll tell you, you, know, you can try everything, try to figure out everything yourself, but in China, you need a local partner. Oh, okay. um, yeah, so I think it's definitely important. Um, it's just a matter of like in what structure you take them on and how you take them on. Mm, okay, that's awesome. So like, the next question is a question that I should have asked before the question I just asked. But it's a question by Dennis Lam is saying, what got you sold on Living Bane for Shopee back then? Living, oh. oh. Yeah. Yes, yeah, speaking. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so please go ahead. What got me sold on Living Bane? Uh? Um, I think I, I, I wanted to, like, I thought the opportunity was, well, was good. There was an e-commerce sector that was really under penetrated. Um, and then, you know, I think Shopee had the right concept. Um, yeah, so then I wanted to, to, to the, the idea was big enough, you know, I wanted to give it a shot. I didn't think too much, to be honest. Like, I really did not think that much when I uh, sometimes make these decisions. And, you know, like I say, you know, I think I'm quite risk loving, which I think that you should be, and you are in a position to be when you're young. So then every time, let's say if there's like two paths, there is one that I can take a balanced risk to more financial reward or more excitement, I will hit that one. Okay, so like for you entering Shopee case, is it a case like when Jack Ma visited the SoftBank guy and then chat with him for an hour, then he decided to invest. But for his case, it's investors. But like for your case, you are inspired by the founder's idea that you decided to join. Yeah, for sure. Are you more inspired by the business model or the founder himself? <laughs> I prefer not to answer that question. <laughs> okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the business model is certainly a great one. I never met the founder. Yes, but, yeah. So I. <laughs> okay, then the, regarding the, just now the COVID strategy, I think like in the modern situations that we sh um, maybe it's a question that like, worth exploring a little, little bit more. Because you said mm -hmm. that uh, it forces a lot of people like going online, right? So right now, mm -hmm. for people that wants to start their new career, you know, still the traditional business dominates the business fields right now. But then, if for a new graduate who's trying to look for a job, what do you? What are the things they you suggest them to look out for when they are searching for the next shopee to join? Hmm. That, I think that's a very good question. Um, I think when you're looking for uh, you know, if it's like, you're going to be a part of an early team, right? Um, one thing that, that I've also learned is that it's, it's about the people when it's so early stage. Um, it's not about so much about the exact product or the business idea. Because if you have a brilliant team, they will find a way for, to pivot or, you know, to, to do whatever. So when you join... Um, a company, you're not really joining because you believe in the vision. You're really joining because you believe in the boss, your boss, your immediate boss. So I think that is yeah. the main thing that these graduates should be um, concerned about. You know, who is interviewing me? Do I look up to that person? Right? Is, is, do, do I feel like I can learn something from him? I think if you can tick these uh, boxes, then that's the company that you should join because he joined. 
Yeah, awesome. Uh, just now, like the Stevens signal actually got cut off, so his question is actually not answered yet. So right now, maybe we take the time back to Stephen and let him finish his questions. Hi, uh, Stephen. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Uh, I, I thought Nick uh, answered uh, quite a bit of the question already in terms of uh, some of the mistakes that he made. Um, and even some of the questions that were asked after that were also around uh, some of the setbacks and, question, uh, and, and mistakes. So, so I, I think that that part has, has been okay. Let, let me ask maybe another question. Uh, uh, Nick, you actually, um, other than Bain, you jumped straight into entrepreneurship and post uh, Shopee, you, uh, you started your own thing and you're investing in uh, other startups. Lah. And yeah. I, I think you also touched on um, for uh, a lot of our participants tonight who wants to be or interested in entrepreneurship. Um, the financial relationship um, and the age aspect. Uh, plus, you also mentioned uh, how you, sh you should come from a position of strength. Um, but, you know, we, we live in a non-idealistic world mm -hmm. where I, I imagine many of us, even notwithstanding the, the situation with COVID, um, I imagine many of us are not in a position of um, good financial situation. Or a good relationship situation, or even might might not be in a, an age where it's, it's good to start a business. What's your advice on that? I guess my, my point is, um, it's easy to imagine a scenario where you start a mis business from a position of strength uh, with very little financial commitment, with no relationship burden. But mm. does that mean that that's the only way to be an entrepreneur, uh, in your view? Mm. I think... Of course, I think there's like so many, there are like so many ways um, uh, uh, to do it, right? And I think, you know, it really depends on um, what, you know, I, what, you, what your strengths are. Let's say if your strengths is like, you know, you very, have a very good um, uh, uh, network and you can raise funds, then raising funds to do it, you know, if you're able to do that, that's, you know, I think to, to me, that's a, 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 a way, right? But like... But if let's say you know you're yeah, not like so lucky or you know like to have all these PC people at, at your fingertips, um, I think one thing that uh, a lot of one thing that um, I've learned also is like you know eventually numbers don't lie, but ideas can, right? So you need to build on and get to some sort of revenue in however small a business you have, because once you have a product that you can like let's say build from from like, you know, just put together something, a product, and you can sell and that you can get revenue from that, right? Then I don't think you're in a position of weakness anymore. But a lot of entrepreneurs feel that they need to raise that, you know, seed round of like 100K before they start. Or, you know, if I don't have like this finished product, this company is not gonna, not gonna, not gonna sign, right? And, there, and that just means that, you know, the, the issue you're solving or the issue that your product is trying to solve is not really, it's not really meshing. So I would say, you know, for a lot of people who want to do startups now and all that, um, is you want to get to um, a cash flow positive situation as early as possible. And it is possible to bootstrap that. So you have to believe, you know, like, 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 like that you can. Uh, and, and if you can bootstrap something like that now, it's definitely possible. I think, you know, like your later on money, you know, your investors, they will be the ones who are crawling to try and invest in your company. I, I think that's great advice. Um, a lot of great companies that we see today started one way or another, um, and many of them from very humble beginnings. Uh, and I guess your message is uh, just make sure you believe in your story uh, and start the product um, and whether it proves that it solves a problem or not. Uh, I think that's fantastic advice and anybody can do that. Whether yeah. it's with, with a partner or with a small team, um, I absolutely agree with that. That's great. Thank you for your question, Stephen. So right now, the right now, so I'm going to ask some questions in, since right now. But then, well, so this one, uh, th this might be refers to the refer to just now a point when someone about like how were young people can discover their strength, right? Like, could you share like some of your your own experience? 
when you converted from a consultant to when you are at Shopee, you need to do everything, then you find your experts in the education world. So maybe you can use yourself as a summer to elaborate on the finding your strength part. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, let me, let me have a think. So I think um, in terms of uh, 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 where my strength is and where it wasn't, right? So actually back then when we were at Shopee uh, and even at Bain, we have even now still have a lot of big data initiatives, right? Okay. So that require you to like a lot of big data, like synthesize data, build models, right? So that was something and it, it still is something that I struggle to do. And I still remember when I was in uh, Shopee because I was like trying to I lead product. Also, so mm-hmm. I had to interface with the, with the technical engineers, and because I didn't know what they were talking about, so I didn't really know didn't really know specs and like how, how tough it is to build something. Mm-hmm. We were in, in this even in the situation where let's say if I asked them to do one modification, they'd be like, "Oh, you know, this is like really complicated," and then um, it would take like six days, but it actually okay. took them maybe like six hours. Okay. Right. So like this is the kind of thing that I think you know like going through that I realized okay you know if I were to actually be part of something that was so there was like big data although that is something that I feel like you know that's the trend right or like that is not just a trend that is like definitely where I I would be if I could be but I shouldn't be because that oh, is not okay. my strength yeah yeah actually uh, this one relates to an earlier point that I brought on about being able to read the con the Taiwan, the financial reports of the companies. So, like, does it implement the same thing that once you read the law contract or something, you need to at least understand it, but you don't need to be an expert at it? Yes, yes. I think, and also with contracts, there's, there's just, our, yeah, with contracts, you, you don't need to be an expert, but I think what's important is, you know, just having, uh, for contracts, right, you need like a good legal advisor, I think, someone yeah. to guide you along the way. Um, because there's one thing that's on paper, right? And then the other thing yeah. is like enforceability. Yeah. Yeah. True. True. So like, well, usually as entrepreneurial startups, you need to at least know the law contracts to draft the outline of the co- of the contract. Then the contract, it still has to be written by a lawyer la, in order to be enforceable. Mm. And it needs to fit the local law. And doing the law system is actually a little bit different in China. And because Singapore and China actually uses different law systems right so like do you, you encounter any difficulties in like interfering oh sorry this one like when you read the contracts the chinese contract and the english contracts then would you understand them in a like you read english contracts shouldn't need uh maybe you don't need any help you just like read it by yourselves yeah. um so now, even now, I would put it into Google Translate and just Google Translate it. And then okay. Google Translate does a pretty good job of saying like what clause uh, means what. And then if I don't know any specific clause, right, I would, I, would, I would go and check it out. But even up to today, I still think that most um, like investors and entrepreneurs, they still read every single line. And we won't just be like, okay, leave it to the lawyer. I will, I will go to the lawyer for oh. advice after I've read one line and not sure what the implications are. But I would never just shove it to the lawyer. <laughs> oh yeah, that, that's. I don't a, think anyone can afford you. Because, Yeah, because you just shove it to a lawyer. The lawyer will probably tell you like this thing is going to take six days to do, but then in the reality, it's going to only take the lawyer six hours. Or maybe the lawyer is just trying to like oh, this one not very difficult to implement. Like, just scare you off with the really serious, disastrous results that this might bring. That's true. Yeah, I mean, le- a legal is. Um, their job is to tell me the risk, right? Yeah. But my job is to weigh the risk benefit. Yeah. True. And when the and sometimes the lawyers they they are on the same side when they advise the clients, it's in mm. their professional spirits to sort of like emphasize the risk a little bit. So the risk might actually the the risk might seem like really scary at that time. But then if you weigh it against the other options, that might be a better result to do. Mm. Yeah. Okay, guys. So, like, any other questions? Okay, so I guess that the. Okay, so like maybe one question is that if you are going, so if you are giving one thing to advise a youth today, given the job market and the COVID situations, what would it be? Hmm. I think um, two, two things, right? I think 
First is um, on the side of education. Um, a lot of people are using this time to further their graduate studies. So yeah. be it doing a master's, if you just graduated, or looking at um, uh, other you know, places where you can do an exchange or something, that's something that is good to do during an economic downturn. Um, so that's one uh, for, for, for fresh grads, because it would definitely add stuff to your, to your resume. Secondly is uh, the, you know, looking for, in, in, if the job market is hard, right, you can always look for um, internships first if you are a new graduate. Um, a lot of the university, like we're, we're running a, a, a career program with the Harvard office. Um, because of the COVID situation, the school is um, giving a stipend um, as a salary to companies who are taking interns, right? So look for such programs. Um, because we are, you know, like doing this online with some of the, the, the Harvard interns. And I'm sure other schools and other companies have also these kind of programs to help their graduates um, get in touch with uh, companies that are still expanding. Mm. And speaking of the job market now, here's an interesting question. Nicholas, what specific area do you need now for your ventures? Want to hire young and strong talents or older folks with some wisdom? Yeah, um, I'll, um, yeah feel free to get in touch with me. Um, I'm always, you know, open to uh, 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 new talent and new ideas and new partners. So definitely always on the, yeah, very, very open to that. Okay. That's awesome. So like, guys, we are like running out of time now. So like maybe, now Nicholas, you want to ask everybody to open their, open their... Yeah. Can everyone office, open your camera? Cameras so yeah, suddenly we can have do a... a yeah. Group so shot. let's open our cameras and let's do a group shot so that everybody please show your pretty handsome face like wisdom leaf. Okay, awesome. We are seeing a lot of young faces and inspired. Hey guys, we have 80 something people in the forum now. We should a lot of face. Awesome. And feel free to change your background to the OSG background. This is like quite awesome. OSG. This is a really well designed logo. Okay, so I guess that um, most people that are able to come is on. Okay, so uh, let's have a round of applause for Nick for his interesting sharing. Uh, virtual one. Just go to do a nice clap. And thank you everybody who asked the questions. And I will need to apologize for Jennifer and KJ. So because we don't have, didn't have enough time for your questions. And everybody, please take care during these COVID situations and be safe. Okay. So right now, maybe I hand the mic back to the OSG, back to OSG to say a last few words to us. So, and conclude our meeting for tonight. A moment, please. Okay, there seems to be some technical errors. No, they can't see me. Oh. Uh, really some technical error. Okay, everybody, so I guess that the, there's some technical errors that we're going to go through right now. But let's not delay everybody's time anymore. So, like... Everybody have a great night. Stay safe. Listen to government. Listen to your local government's directive on the COVID-19. And we have such seminars every Thursdays. So I apologize to everybody. This is my first time being a moderator. Hopefully I've done an okay job. And we have an awesome speakers like Nick and an awesome organizing team. Thank you to Lily. Thank you to Eng Han. Thank you to Ken. And thank you to our expert panel, Stephen and Kenny. And thank you everybody for being here. It's awesome to have you. And hopefully you can be here next Thursday. We have we have such events every Thursday with different experts, different panelists, different speakers sharing. Okay, everybody, have a good night and be safe. All right, thank you, everyone. Bye.